Hello and welcome to another episode of Tradecraft Tuesday. This is March 10th, 2020. Uh, so as always, we are your hosts, John Farrell, Kyle Hanselman, and I'm Chris Biznet. Um, so for anybody who's been here before, thanks for coming out again. Uh, we put these on second Tuesday of every month. Um, but for anybody who's new, Tradecraft Tuesday is a show where we cover and break down attacker tradecraft, TTPs, um, in an effort to help network defenders and network administrators um, understand the risks, understand what attackers are doing, and hopefully be able to uh, protect their networks a little bit better. So uh, before we get into it, let's talk about Zoom, uh, how the webinar works. I don't know if it's really called a webinar, but whatever. We're going with cast, that. I think Webcast. is the cool word. That's what the hip kids talk about. Uh, so there is chat. Um, when you're in chat, make sure you click the like panelists and attendees. Otherwise, other people won't be able to see what you're talking about. Um, there's also a Q&A feature, so if any point during the episode you have a question about something, um, you want to point out something to us, something like that, throw it in Q&A. Uh, that makes it easy for us to see. Please ask questions. If there's something that we mentioned that we didn't really cover what it's about, you want to know, hit us up. Um, and as always, if afterwards you have any questions, comments, ideas for things we should cover in the future, interesting news, Trolling comments about my amazing good looks. Yeah. I'll, I'll take them all. <laughs> yep. uh, Tradecraft Tuesday at Huntress.com. You can always uh, reach us there. So um, today's topic is going to be defense evasion. We're continuing to work our way through the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, and this is such a big topic. And when we looked at it, it had so many interesting things. We're going to split this into two parts. So this will be part one. But before we get into that, uh, you want to hit up on some of these recent events slash news yeah so uh when i was thinking about defense evasion you know we we, we talk about always the malware we're going to get deep into that but um you know usually you got to get the malware in there somehow and i think one of the ones the hottest ways going on right now is there's a remote code execution vulnerability in exchange right now so if you're still running hosted or on-prem exchange please patch yeah. um Long story short, from what I understand, this was the cryptographic keys for like protecting, was it browser cookies? Yes. Browser yep. cookies and maybe state stores were not unique in exchange. And from what I understand, it went back several years. Yeah. Uh, allowed the attackers to be able to craft a malicious payload. The malicious payload gets deserialized by the exchange server and gets arbitrary code execution. I believe from what I understand, it requires some form of authentication. I don't require, uh, recall if it's privileged or not. Uh, but the long story short is, say, for instance, if an attacker previously got into your exchange server or popped something, maybe on the dark web got your creds, but you had two-factor. They couldn't get in. This being a, a authenticated bug where you have to be able to have at least credentials, but not necessarily two-factor, um, they're able to use some of the proof of concepts that are both available on GitHub. Uh, I think a module is already added to Metasploit. And the long story short is gain that initial access, bypassing some of that code. Um, so there's some fantastic resources. Microsoft has already put some security guidance out there. Um, and from everything we've read, O365 is, is not targeted on this. Um, anybody else have anything else to add? I know uh, the team at Trusted Security, I think that's Dave Kennedy and his, uh, his team, they, they posted some pretty good uh, resources that we just pasted here in the link in regards to how can you detect if your Exchange server has been you know, affected. Uh, it looks at the event logs, things of that nature. So go take a look at that. Yep. Yep. Uh, proof of concepts are already out. They're already on GitHub. Um, you can find the link um, from the Trusted Sec blog, or you can probably just Google it. Um, if you hear banging in the background... Uh, apparently, Sounds maintenance like picked today <laughs> of all days, and this time to I don't know, <laughs> Sounds like it's right above bang us on the pipes or something. I don't know. So uh, we apologize for that. Live video. <laughs> what can you do? So um, what else? Uh, attackers. Attackers are continuing to get better with their... Uh, sometimes I argue they're getting better than us at business. Yeah. Um, definitely so, at marketing. There's like some attacker business school that we don't know about or something. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of these good examples, and, and I'll actually do some screen sharing while we bring it up real quick, but, um, you know, I, I always love to see how attackers want to get people to fall for a fish. Um, they've kind of realized, I think, the unpopular but age-old adage that, what is it, sex sells? Yep. So and it's like marketing 101 or whatever? 
And so the, the downfall of this is the attackers have also used this to their advantage. So here, I'll, I'll screen share. This is an article bleeping computer uh, brought to news or brought to light. But what I want to highlight here is take a look at this. Malware spread as nude extortion fix a friend's girlfriend. So I'll summarize it so we're not just reading this. But the long story short was you receive an email that says, hey, Chris, you've got this guy, John, over here, and we got into his computer. We've got all kinds of stuff extorting John, and we've even got pics, nude pics of John's girlfriend. And uh, with that said, John's not paying the ransom. He doesn't want to do it. But, uh, you know, we're about to go public if John doesn't pay. And I think uh, the, the lure, right, was to prove to you that we've actually got access was it, uh, please click this attachment? Yeah, that's exactly yep. what it is. <laughs> yep. Here's this macro-enabled Word document. Only available to the desktop version. Please enable editing, enable content, and voila. Yep. And we know where this is going to go. Really grainy, somewhat suggestive, fairly suggestive photo, right? Little do they know it's actually pictures of me <laughs> in there, not John's uh, wife. So either way, uh, we, we see that uh, hackers continue to get innovative with their lures. So no surprise there. Yep. Be on the lookout. The same thing. Use your user education, phishing training, monitoring. Same old, same old on that end. Just, uh, you know, new day, new vector. Yep. Uh, ransomware. Uh, have you heard of Pwned Locker? Only because the team at MSYSoft, uh, you know, uh, reached out or, oh. you know, shared some of that there. But no, I hadn't heard of Pwn Blocker beforehand. No, I'd never heard of it either. But apparently if you or someone you know has uh, been ransomed by Pwn Blocker, MSYSoft was able to create a decryptor for it. Um, so mm -hmm. if you have and you store it off the drives or something, uh, you can call them and, and they will help you out. Yeah, I think it was, uh, was it? Uh, Fabian Wasser and yep. Mike Gillespie again coming yep. and saving the day. So huge kudos to that team. Yep, they, right. did, they didn't say how exactly it's decryptable, uh, but the one caveat is they do actually need the original ransomware executable. Um, but then they did specify in the article that uh, in, in some cases the attackers will delete that. So even if you did, uh, they may not be able to help you just because you didn't capture the file. But uh, they talked about in there the different places you can look for it. Uh, temp, C users folder, um, and then somewhere else. The is app in there. data folder. Oh, app data. Yep. Profile. Yep. So it, great, great heads up, obviously, to any IT department or MSP out there, too. When you have these ransomware files, uh, I know it's quick to get into cleanup mode to help recover, but you could understand that a lot of these cases, sometimes just rebooting the computer too early with private keys were in memory, or mm -hmm. sometimes not saving a copy of the actual decryption. Uh, uh, the ransom, ransom, notice. ransom notice that has the, the, key in it or the you know unique identifier. ID yep. in there. All these could prevent or hinder your actual remediation, and sometimes can prevent you from being able to restore. So, just a, a good heads up on that type of stuff. So, without further ado, I think we we just covered news. So, somebody want to talk a little bit about defense evasion, what it's all about, uh, how MITRE covers it. I was trying to bring up the. I, I've got a link here yeah, for the MITRE attack the framework. I brought that up first so while I'm bringing up MITRE attack uh, gents last last month obviously was evasion um, or sorry was lateral movement this one is about evasion so I've, I've got it ready here and we're now screen sharing uh, for everybody to take a peek but the idea behind it is this is just as simple as who wants to get caught I don't want to get caught as a hacker you right. can imagine that it, you know gets in the way of their business um, in addition to it, there's a lot of different ways that you might want to include, like, do I, you know, actually pwn the defensive software? Do I try to get around some of the sexy, like, machine learning, AI heuristics, you mm -hmm. name it? Mm -hmm. um, or just how can I abuse the reputation of trusted or legitimate applications? That's a lot of that fileless malware or lull bins, living off the land, trusted application piece. So there's almost an endless amount of these. Notice there's 73 techniques. This is, is this the largest of it all is. the techniques? Yep. It is the largest uh, tactic category Ooh, that contains the right. most techniques. Yeah, largest uh, tactic. So yep. um, anyways, tons of different ways. Binary padding, controlled bypassing <laughs> uh, for like UAC. You name it, there is a boatload. And the whole goal here is we took a little bit of time to you know, kind of get a good idea of what do we see most often and what is most often not talked about. For instance, you could imagine antivirus evasion. We, we've done whole episodes on that in the past. Or abusing admin privileges, creating yep. backdoor accounts, 
all of that stuff, good to know. But one thing that tends to not get talked about a whole lot is, you know, probably in the last 10, 15 years, we've started digitally signing our executables with those digital uh, signatures. It's a way to be able to say, hey, you know, John or Chris, they really did create that program they're giving to me, whether it's the Hunter's Binary or, you know, some, you know, open source app, you would hope it would be signed so you could cross-reference it. Um, and this is not a substitute for still comparing the hash. It's not as similar as like actually validating the hash itself, but the idea behind it is supposed to be more extensible. As long as the private key hasn't been disclosed that was used to actually digitally sign the application, you should have some, what would you call it, elevated level of trust? Is that a fair way to, to say that? Yeah, yeah, some additional trust, yeah. yeah. So what happens is that actors you know, across the years have uh, been known for targeting some of these code signing certificates. So, John, you, you sign our, our, our agent. You want to talk a little bit about how we use it, maybe the difference between you know, the, uh, the uh, traditional digital certificate versus the EV version, and then I'll prepare for the next little yep, bit so, of this. Yes, we use the EV signing certificate. So uh, the way these are supposed to work is the company that gives you the certificate is supposed to do additional verification. They do some checks to make sure you're an actual business. They call the phone number and verify. Yeah that this is the address. They, they probably could actually go a little bit farther than they do, and they probably should, but uh, they don't at this time. But you get a, a dongle that you connect to your computer and use that to sign. So you always have to have the physical token with you when you sign this. Makes it harder for somebody to steal your certificates and reuse them. You can't right. accidentally post them somewhere. I don't know how many people actually use that because a lot of people want to, you know, include their CICD pipeline the, yeah. so that they just push to their repo. It goes through, um, you know, continuous testing, and then out comes a binary. And they want it to be able to be signed, but if I've got to, like, download that, plug in this physical device and stuff, um, you know, obviously that's not going to work. So I don't know how many people are using the EV certificate because one of the things with EV is you have to have that physical yeah. uh, dongle. So. And I think it's it's even up to each CA on how they define EV. I think there's some like wiggle room of how tight you get it. Um, oh, really? Yeah, there, there's all kinds of that those shenanigans that go with it. But uh, I was going to say, and you even see it some in the browser too. That's the little extra green yeah. lock that people pay for. There's not a lot of extra <laughs> no, that they do. No. I mean, I think when we got ours, they called me and they were like, hey, is this Chris from Hunters? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, do you know John? And I was like, yeah. Yep. And they're like, okay, cool. That's all we need to know. And I was like, how do you, what? And they check, what's the other one? They check in some business database. Oh, really? And I can't remember Is what. It like Duns? Dun yes, Duns they check for Duns. Things. And anybody can register yeah. for a Duns account. Yeah. All right. And, and they just want your address to match. I mean, they said it was extended validation, not perfect validation. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So anyways, there's a way to be able to sign applications uh, to give a little bit more trust. And you can imagine hackers, uh, you know, are interested in this. Anything that would help their software evade or bypass defenses is a, a big win. And so there's been plenty of research on this historically. Uh, John, you had even done some of the research where uh, we were looking at instead of even stealing somebody's private key or try to get your own private key, some people were literally like just crudely cutting and pasting, right, effectively appending yep. the uh, signature to their I'll, own binaries? I'll paste the link. Yeah, Matt Graber had actually done some research on this about cloning code signing certificates. And his idea was you clone the local repo and then modify it and put a, a an invalid uh, or a fake certificate in there. So if you're verifying certificates on the device itself, oh, right. the... Uh, it says it's trusted even though it's not an actual reputable certificate. But along with that, he had some information about cloning the certificate. So I did some testing, and I was curious about it. Do you have the slides, Kyle? Yeah, the, so, so I have a Emotet. handful of slides. Which one are you looking for, John? The Emotet one, so I can show um, the before and after. So that's when we originally found it. So this is, yeah, you can share that. All right, so give me about half a second here to do some screen sharing. And uh, unfortunately, this is some of the nonsense that we deal with on a daily, uh, and it's always nice to show like what is actually working. So, John, you want to explain this slide real quick? Yep. Let me. I can this is nothing more than you got a little bit. I can't uh, see. Oh, there it goes. So this is when this is from an Emotet binary that we originally found back in December. Um, at the time, nothing had seen it in virus total. You can see down at the bottom a screenshot of the hash, and we had found it. Um, we catch these via various methods, um, but I took 
Matt Graber's research and I was like, well, what happens if I, so if you bring up the next image, you can see that Virus Total has it all over the place now. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna go to zoom into our little link here. And for those that are not familiar, right, Virus Total, nothing more than an online scanning engine that does some sort of analysis to give you some level of heads up, would this engine, usually the static detection engine, been able to discover yep. it? So in this case, 62 of 73 engines have flagged this as Emotet. You can clearly see that. So taking Matt Graber's research, he has a little script that allows you to, you first export the script or the certificates and the chain from one of the binaries. So I took kernel 32, mm -hmm. extracted the certificates, and then uh, PowerShell includes a command, and it's escaping me now, that you can clone the certificate or get the certificate from a binary yep. and then append it to another one. So I took a Emotet binary, took the Microsoft certificate off of the kernel 32 and attached it to Emotet. And right away you can see a lot of things caught it, but uh, only this time 46 of 72. So nothing changed code-wise, it was just the fact that it now had a certificate it was actually shows you can, I uh, should have taken a screenshot of it. In Windows, you can right click on it and see it has a certificate, but it's not verified hmm. because it's not. So we went from 60 some detections to 46. 46. So yeah, lost 18. And there's been, engines. there's been plenty of these type of, you know, examples. Deep Instinct here, their Black Hat 2016 uh, white paper, certificate bypass, hiding the execution of malware from digitally signed executables, all kinds of good research in here. Uh, we'll paste those links. In addition to it, Mauer signed old Bruce Schneier calls out all kinds of the benefits of Stuxnet, the use and abuse of digital signed signatures and how they get around certain things. Um, and it just keeps going, right? All the way down to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll save this one for a little bit later. But there's a whole lot that can be done here. So John and I, right, started with, you know, that's that's how a lot of code signing bypasses had, had worked historically. Um but there's not a whole lot available on legit code signing. So, for instance, there's a lot of threat actors that will compromise, like, a software manufacturer. A lot of the game manufacturers, especially in Asia, have been compromised over the last couple of years, where one of the most prized things that some of the APT actors were stealing was the private key. So, and a good example of this is if you go out on the dark web forums, you see people here, like, actually looking for, hmm. I'm looking for a code signing certificate. Uh, you know, this was translated from Russian, so, you know, t it's as good as the... Uh, <laughs> Google Translate thing works, but I will buy a certificate for signing. You know, followed up with almost right after that, ready-made certificates. You know, for a regular signing certificate, I'll give it to you mm. for 800 bucks. You want the EV certificate though, it's 1700. EV for SSL, additional $500. So you can see there's really an actual need for this. Legit hackers asking for, you know, I need this capability. And our, our favorite forum, right, old Torum here on the, on the dark web, you know, and here's a salty guy <laughs> saying, hey, anyone know where I can find somebody that actually, you know, can sell me some real hacking material? I keep trying to buy these anonymous code signing certificates, but I just keep finding drugs. Uh, <laughs> Only drugs. You know, you win, you lose some, whatever. Sounds like there's some uh, business opportunity there. Yeah, really. This is clearly somebody's opportunity to, to grow a proper uh, forum. Yeah. What's interesting about this is this piqued our interest back in August, almost the end of uh, you know September, or sorry, beginning of September, that uh, one of our favorite security researchers, uh, Vincent, actually called out and said, hmm, you know, I just stumbled onto online code design or codesign.com. You know, uh, why don't I use this to sign my macros instead, right? You can see where that thought process is going. And so we kind of looked at each other and we're like, well, why not? Right, uh, yeah. Tradecraft Tuesday doesn't just have to be on what hackers are doing. It could also be on why don't we push some of the limits. And so a good example of this is we jumped onto online code sign, and right away they said, "We'll code sign your executable and drivers." So not just like your user space, but your kernel code oh, fantastic. with an extended validation certificate for just thirty bucks. Thirty bucks is pretty cheap. Yeah, I mean that's a great SaaS opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, I can I can see the allure, but obviously all of us inside are like dying. We're like, no, you know, you can't. You can't pull this back. Yeah, I mean, they're really taking, like, the code signing is is designed to authenticate and say, like, hey, this is an app I created because only I can sign things with it. And now it's like, they just, like, threw it out. It's like, oh, yeah, we'll sign literally anything. Yep. In the chat that's going on right now, the live chat, someone was even keen to point out Troy Hunt's 
uh, you know, research that said, you know, this is the death of extended validation certificates. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for it is nonsense like this, yep. in addition to failed extended validation and stolen signing certificates and them not being hardware tokens. Like, if you want to steal John's token, you just got to beat him with a $5 wrench. But, uh, you know, the idea of this online, you know, give them 30 bucks, get signed application. If this truly was true, this is a you know kind of a, a really terrible thing. So let's uh, let's explore a little further. So we immediately went out. Paul Melson, who's another one of our favorite researchers, does a lot of the paste bin scraping. A fantastic uh, project called uh, Scumbots, I believe, is his that will go out there and scrape paste bin for all kinds of nasty stuff. So the reason this was really interesting was Paul flat out called and said, you know what? Here's some brand new ransomware called Boran or Boran. You know, the paste bin article. So we grabbed it immediately. Hmm. At the time, it was seen by 42 engines, but we were like, whatever, let's see if we sign this thing if it drops. So we immediately went out to online code sign. And our friend Josh Milton from Ransomware Incorporated with his <laughs> Mailinator email address in St. Petersburg, Russia, said, hey, <laughs> will you please, pretty, pretty please sign my, uh, my ransomware? Yeah. And thankfully, it immediately rejected, right? It said, hey, sucker, failed, you know? Um, and so we were rejected. And that kind of gave us a little bit of, uh, you know, happiness, but a little bit of disdain as well, because the reality is, you know, um, this sucker was 56 pieces of signatures later, and that was only like a couple days, you know, later that we took a, took a look at this. But notice here, we were like, well, it's rejected, we waited a little bit longer, it jumped up to 56, but if we start taking a look at these signature names between the differences of 42, notice AVG and Avira here, there's no AVAS, they're calling it file reputation malware, but just a little bit longer, we notice this has now changed to Trojan generic, AVG is now in the list, AVAS is both in the list. So we started looking at that here, notice Trojan generic? And we started thinking, well, you know, Avast and AVG also have that same signature. Is there a chance they're just using somebody else's engine under the hood? Like maybe they've OEM license? So let's be real. Uh, hackers are going to hack. Yeah. And so we... Uh, of course, of course. You know, so we, we decided to take it a little bit step further, right? So we went and found another. This was Remcos, a uh, keystroke logger. At the time that it was found, uh, it had only been seen three minutes on uh, Virus Total. And notice neither AVG nor Avast had seen it before. So I had found, had reverse engineered Remcos keystroke logger before, so I knew how it worked. I knew it was going to be a good target. So once again, we went back to online code sign. We gave them our 30 bones. By the way, they keep your 30 bucks if you fail. Oh, they did? Yeah, so oh. I was having to pay 30 bucks for the failed rates of wear. Um, you know, good model. Don't be shady. I guess. Um, so this time we came back as Josh Milton from Mauer Incorporated, once again at St. Petersburg, Russia. Um, and I actually had a, con a phone number validation pe feature. I had to get my Russian phone number in there. Uh, but notice this time that we <laughs> upload. Nice. We now see, voila. Completed. Right? Uh, great success. You know, everybody here is stoked. Um, so with that said, I've now got a copy of the Remcos, you know, uh, keystroke logger digitally signed. Now we wait. Yeah, right? Now we wait is kind of what, what were we going to do with it? And so some people, as we were showing this, like it was the company here, Eveth Information Technology, was the uh, signed certificate. And notice the CA was a DigiCert EV certificate. So this is kind of like cream of the crop. Even on the hacker forums, you'll find some people say, like, I'll give you extra money or, you know, Komodo, I'll give you $800 for it. But in uh, DigiCert EV, that'll be $1,500. Mm. It really is worth more. Uh, from who the CA is, so it's got great reputation here. And once again, you install the ransom or the the keystroke logger. It created its persistence mechanism. Worked just like as you expected. Drop some shady VBS file. That's what was being called by the URL file. And you know, here's some more indirection to call our signed winrs.exe. So this was the signed executable file. Made a copy of itself and established persistence. So, you know, great success. We're all stoked <laughs> our, our malware's working. So we started looking here at what we could do, and we noticed, you know, this was still 44 detections. Um, and it really bothered us, you know, 44 detections, because all of these, in, you know, instances where we were testing, we had actually done some local testing against antivirus. 
I'll call out Windows Defender, but we'll mention there was others that we tested against that we had no issue with our digital signature blowing right by where they were previously catching the execution of the non-signed application. So there's un undeniably definite success that happens here. But we started wondering, like, what happens if we upload this to virus total? But at the same time, we weren't looking to alert hackers that were going on. So, you know, you could imagine we had to do our due diligence. Um, we worked, our, our uh, DigiCert has now actually revoked that signing certificate. And we decided that instead of uploading that, uh, you know, unsigned malware and the signed malware, both to VirusTotal, we would hold off and actually do a live upload of the signed malware to VirusTotal. So we don't even know what the results are yet. Yeah. But we do want to share that before be doing this, you know, we've made sure the certificate that's out there, it's been revoked. So there might be some difference in results. Um, Online code sign is now down as well. If you click that, pay 30 bucks, uh, they're not able to do this for you. Mm. So, you know, we, we've done our due diligence to make sure we're not going to, uh, you know, bring down the, the world completely here with this. So let's, um, we're going to do this? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Scoop. So somebody want to give me a little bit of, uh, you know, we'll go to virus total. Want to maybe narrate for me a little bit? We're out at virus total. <laughs> and the first thing virus total does is. Yep. Let me choose the file. And say, hey, upload your file. So now you can go and choose the malicious signed file. Um, and just to be clear here, we're not suggesting that any engines that may not flag this, we're not suggesting that they'll not flag anything that's signed. Honestly, it could just be like they blacklisted the hash, and now because it has a signature on it, the hash is different, and so it doesn't categorize there. We're not sure. The only way you'd know is you'd really have to dig in um, to figure out why it wasn't. Um, <laughs> well, this is going to get funny. I just scanned it, and uh, Defender just got Killed me. It. This, uh, this might be the demo gods beating me right now. Uh, let's try. Upload, upload, upload. Confirm upload before Defender gets it. It looks like we got it. So clearly it's never been scanned before because it's actually queuing All off right. the analysis. Let's it's never been got. seen. Okay, we're getting some. So we're up to 21, not bad, since considering it was like 40 or so when we checked earlier today. Still finding, you see Avira here sees it as Remcos. Can't believe Defender saw it and didn't grab it right away. Yeah, I wonder why I didn't quarantine. Um, while we're doing this on one window, let's... Uh, let me open another window just to show, like, if you did a virus total search right now on this thing. It should theoretically, as long as the analysis is still queuing. Oh, I think I just missed it. It just finished its thing. Yep. I was trying to show that this thing had never been seen before. But I guess there is a online parameter that says first seen. Yep. So we see, though, the, the end score is 34. So theoretically... You know, we had dropped it, what is that, by almost 20%? Yeah. 44 to 34? What does the detail say? It should say that the certificate is revoked. Yep, it's creation time. Obviously, you see when we signed this sucker back on uh, September 2nd, first submission was indeed today. Yeah. You know, exactly UTC time at, uh, you know, 1728 or 130 uh, or 128 Eastern time. Mm -hmm. And notice we said, hey, the file signature could not be verified, even though it was there. This should suggest that... Uh, yeah, certificates in the chain have been revoked. Yep, yeah, mm -hmm. trust for the certificate of one of the certificates has been revoked. So fantastic. But you can see, even with it revoked, we actually still get some evasion. So yeah. hopefully this is a little bit cooler version of us uh, talking a little bit about the way that people bypass defenses with evasion, yep. for defense evasion. Yep. Um, but please, if you have questions, fire off. Well, uh, everybody's joking in chat. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, Windows Defender was definitely on the run, but clearly didn't get us quick enough. We had to do the emergency upload. <laughs> um, it you know, it would have really been... I'm curious to see how the results have been tainted by the certificate having been revoked. Yeah. Like, had we uploaded it prior to certificate being revoked, prior to people knowing that those, you know, that you could sign anything with that certificate, would we have got the same results or would we have got a lot less? I, I don't know. Yeah, de definitely open for research. So somebody looking for a cool black hat talk to give or DEF CON talk, maybe this is where you pick up from Tradecraft Tuesday and continue yeah. onward. Yeah. And likely you'll see that number, that virus total number, you'll see that go up over the next few hours and days. Um, one of the things that if you work with virus total long enough, what you'll notice is like it, they kind of tend to follow each other. 
Uh, so, like... Hey, ten people saw this. Yeah. It's yeah. suspicious enough for ten people. It must be suspicious. I should call it generic or cryptic yeah. or all the other words that mean, I'm not sure, I'm just trusting the reputation of the cloud. Right. Which is a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, yeah, actually, I was going to say that... The Emotep one that I was at 42, it's now at 51. Yeah. So that's a good that's, example yeah. of people getting better and growing. Obviously, if you happen to be that, you know, patient zero, you're not going to get that same protection. Albeit, it's not necessarily as hardcore as you discovered it at day one or day zero. Yeah. Um, but I get it. So what else? We, we got code signing. And code signing, by the way, was, uh, I think it's T1116 is the yep. uh, tactic. Technique. So, do technique. I'm failing all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So what, what what are we going to go do next? I saw uh, a whole bunch of ones. So that were cool. um, the next one that we thought, or at least I thought, was was pretty cool. We we had seen a few times in the wild um, was something the a technique that they're calling compile after delivery. This is technique T one five zero zero, and basically this is like attackers trying to bypass. Uh, defensive means by instead of bringing like a binary they bring source code and they compile it later so uh, I know John had found some examples of this stuff in the wild do you want to yep, yep. cover um, it yeah about 2018 we saw several times and I actually wrote a blog and I'll we'll just talk about the blog but I'll paste the link to it um, can you bring up those slides yeah, yeah I'll get you Johnny I'll, I'll bring up both um your slides and pictures here for you. What do you want first? Do you want your blog? Uh, I, I paste the, you don't have to bring up the blog. I just paste the blog into the thing. Okay. I just the slides. I'll just go over at a high level. So every, when I used to do Linux admin, I would make sure that I didn't have any compilers installed on my Linux host just in case you got compromised and nobody could build yep. tools right there. Yep. Yep. But Windows nowadays comes with a built-in compiler, always installed the Visual C Sharp command line compiler csc.exe. So think about that. And John, if I recall, it's it shipped with like if you're running .NET, it's yep. in there, right? It's, it's included with .NET. In fact, um, when I was testing the PowerShell for the um, signing the Emotep binary, I downloaded a, a VM from Microsoft to test Edge. They're testing Edge uh, VMs, and it was already included. I didn't have to do anything. It's just ships with it. So, John, I got a handful so, of images you sent for me from some of your analysis. So, yeah, this is the first one. Um, I should bring up my page so I can see. Uh, there we go. So, this was uh, executable was pointed to by a URL file that we found on a customer's host. And we looked at the executable. It didn't have any hits and virus total. Kind of looking at it, it didn't look like it actually did anything, but it turned out to be a .NET, so we were able to open it up with DN Spy. And right off the bat, you see only three functions that this thing does. Compile, main, and Zor encrypt. So we took a little bit more look at it. It's kind of strange. The, the Zor encrypt was a, a flag right away. Um, Come on, XOR is like the greatest type yeah. of encryption, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. But uh, digging a little bit in the main function, what was interesting about this particular one is it looked at a resource inside itself. Uh, resource... ID 130 is actually the HTML resource inside the executable. Mm. So taking a closer look at the executable with resource hacker, that's that step three. In HTML resource 130, there's a PNG file embedded in this. That's machine. a bit odd, you yeah. know, and the hackers are definitely known historically to embed stuff within PNG headers. So pulling apart this PNG actually is a, um, I'll, I'll talk about it. It's actually the C sharp code that gets compiled. The, the assembly, which is the .NET file, decrypts that, unzors it, becomes assembly that they compile. And you can see this is actually the command that the thing runs. It was randomly generated each time. And if you're quick enough, you can catch it because it will write to this temp file and show you the command line that it actually did. It uh, created a DLL file. And the DLL file gets compiled and injected into memory and loaded. And that's what it was doing behind the scenes. And it all happens so fast, it deletes it within a few milliseconds each time. Um, but en ended up being, if I think the next screenshot was a, a list of all the things. 
running in memory. So this is what the malware was capable of. After we decoded, pulled it out of memory and decoded it, these are the functions that the actual malware has. But nowhere on disk was this living until it was actually compiled. Yeah, so and running you, in memory. If you think about like being the antivirus engine, right? You're obviously going to, you know, modern AV is going to be doing plenty of signatures, looking on disk as soon as the file gets written. In addition to it, they're going to run and take a look at signatures. Um, they they also might emulate some of the instructions to figure out what it's going to do. Um, but clearly, like some of that, like it didn't even have the instructions right for the assembly. It was it was XORed, so it was yeah. obfuscated. And and actually, the initial assembly that gets created that DLL file itself is it. Uh, obfuscated. So it, once it gets into memory, it reads itself and decrypts itself. Gotcha. So, so there's never any the malicious file on disk. So yeah. So at that point, John, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It's now going to after it, you know, decodes its routine. It's going to use the built-in signed Microsoft.NET, you know, C# -sharp compiler, right? Yeah. CSC.exe. Yep. And so compiles the DLL. DLL. Injects that DLL into memory into probably a some legit process. Like creates a well, it creates a th remote thread and injects it. Yeah, new process. And then there you go. You've got your DLL. The DLL is still obfuscated, right? Yep. And then the DLL decrypts itself in memory, so you only get the actual shadiness in memory alone. Hmm. And then you could imagine at this point, it's up to your behavior-based detection to do its best job to be able to say like. You know, hey, if somebody's wanting to delete my passwords or somebody's trying to get into my Minecraft, that's, a, that's some silly functionality, but you clearly see keyboard hook. You see some of the antivirus killer type features. Um, super interesting. So I can see how it gets around. I can see yep. why this is so darn yep. popular. Mm -hmm. And there's been lots of this, by the way. If you dig further online, Twitter is a great place to be able to look for these. This is not a new technique. We're mm -hmm. about, what, two years into two and a half years since maybe sub T and that's Casey Smith that did a lot of his original research saying this is where attackers are going. This is where he sees it going. So if you're looking to learn more, please jump out there. We'll obviously share the links, but uh, gents, we're 40 minutes into this. We want to maybe yep. take some questions real quick. I'll stop screen sharing and we'll, we'll take a look to see what people are asking and, and some of the comments. Uh, yep. Somebody asked if it was our request to have that site taken down or just something else. Oh, so that's a good question. A lot of these, when you cooperate with, um, you know, a, uh, a, you know, any type of person, I don't want to just say Digicert because that makes it seem terrible. Um, but you'll notice if you see stuff tweeting from my account at 1 a.m. in the morning to like somebody's official support, like uh, we recently did this with, was it, it wasn't DNS filter, it was somebody else that we had recently had to talk to, not just Vericode or Digicode. Um, I'll go take a look at it while we're searching here. There's a lot of time where you ask or you report something. Dying DNS? Dying DNS, that's exactly what oh, it was. Yeah. We were working with Dying DNS to, to figure out some of these compromised MSP customers that we, we found on the dark web. You don't necessarily get an answer back. So all we know is we partially contributed to it. Um, that was actually very similar to that issue the other day when we got that uh, or helped contribute getting that hacker arrested. We knew we had notified the MSP. We knew we had passed information over to Baltimore, but we actually found that the team at Binary Defense in Ohio had simultaneously worked and actually were the buying agents with, uh, with the FBI. So it'd be crazy to assume that we are the sole reason that the website got took down or the sole reason that the certificate was revoked. We just know we did our part, but sometimes you never hear back on that end, especially from law enforcement, of what your end result is. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely don't you know take credit for saying it was all of us yeah uh someone asked if we could talk to solar winds passportal and get them to sign their software um we can send an email yeah uh, <laughs> uh there's a lot of people who don't sign their software yeah uh it's super surprising how many people just like i don't know push binaries without being signed yeah so uh the team at uh, gosh, there's an application whitelisting team, Dean, Danny's company. You remember Threat Locker? Threat Locker. Threat Locker runs into this problem for the software. They're doing a lot of like application whitelisting, and they also use both binary hashes and the signing of a certificate to add reputation. Um, so, yes, uh, Huntress is adding for different reasons, uh, adding some of the certificate uh, reputation as well. So, yes, we will undeniably reach out to vendors because it will directly influence some of the way that some of our new features that we're working on are going to work. Um so yeah, 100, 110% there. Um, 
Anybody else? I mean, questions, comments, let's see. Uh, you can do something with uh, script handlers too. Oh my gosh, there's all kinds of shady stuff that you can do here uh, to blacklist these type of files, like running CSC. There's a lot of reasons that you wouldn't want csc.exe to run if you're not compiling code. No. Consider that. With that said, if there's anything I can tell you, now that we've got you know a half million computers under management, we see crazy bad things written into legitimate <laughs> software. Yeah. So just keep in mind that if you do use something like, you know, a shell handler or an IFEO debugger to neuter and not allow uh, csc.exe to run, your mileage may vary on what you might cause. I'll have to think. I'm trying to think. I think recently somebody asked me to look into something, and it was an update for a Lenovo, and they were using csc.exe to compile something oh, when they really? were running it. I'm not I'll sure if you can get rid of CSC because, yeah, like, yeah. all of .NET is, like, just yeah. in time compiled, right? So I don't know if you can get rid of the compiler. What was it? It might be rough. You, you might be able to get rid of the front-end executable, but the compiler itself, probably not. But there's yeah, a lot of things underneath the hood that use it and you just don't realize it. Uh, so as an, somebody asked, as an MSP, should we look at signing our PowerShell management scripts? Any tips? Ooh. Fantastic. Obviously, if you're signing your management scripts, I can tell you firsthand that if you have, whether it's your own team or whether it's uh, you have like a sock as a service, I can tell you people like uh, John's folks actually go and validate and it helps us establish reputation. Obviously, signed things don't mean they're perfect. Your signing certificate can get jacked just like anything else. So um, I highly encourage it. There are built in features now. PowerShell makes it very easy to sign. For anybody who hasn't seen what PowerShell signed executables look like, it actually has like a base64 buffer at the end of your PowerShell mm -hmm. yep. that, uh, you know, unlike authentic code that appends it to the binary, this is, you know, you can see it in clear text. Yeah, it's, it's really big, neat. Big comment. But I mean, it, it definitely gives you, you know, if you have like a really long, you know, couple hundred line PowerShell script, um, how do you know that it only contains what you expect it to contain, right? It's easy for somebody to go add something in there. So if you sign it with your cert, and, and you can verify that that signature, then you know that it hasn't been tampered, uh, and you're still good. But you know, it's one of those things that you gotta you gotta do and check. Oh boy! All right. So what's uh, what was next? Oh, I know one that we got requested. Um, it was actually came in over email. Someone said, "I know you're doing defense evasion. How does it work against these next gen AV, ML, deep learning, neural networking, all that fancy model and, and AI?" that somebody asked, how is that happening there? And I think one of the topics that, that could relate was, is it binary padding? Yeah. So maybe, maybe I'll, I'll screen share real quick. We'll bring up binary padding, but uh, we'll use that to pivot. Uh, so Chris, you want to tell just a little bit while I bring this up about binary padding? Yeah. Why people do it? So binary padding is really just what it sounds like. So you're going to be modifying a binary uh, and they, they call it binary padding because that's like the most naive general cases where you're going to take some data and, and just add it to the end of a file. Um, and in some cases, the file will be okay. In some cases, it won't. Um, but a lot of times with Windows binaries, like whatever's at the end of the file, it doesn't matter, right? Like it's just going to it's gonna load some sections into, uh, into memory. But like if there's extra data at the end, it's just whatever. Who cares? Um, so basically... There were some researchers who were looking at this problem and they found Silence um, and they were like, that's really cool. It has this whole AI and these neural networks and how does all that work? And so they started doing some research into it, trying to figure out um, what does it do? How does it work? Kind of looking for, for flaws. And um, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I, I do want to give some background on like kind of how a, the AI modeling works and how they use that to detect stuff. Um, and so what they're going to do is they're going to take any given file and they're going to write all these little bits of code that are going to pull out all kinds of different properties of the file. And we're talking very simple things in some cases. Size of the file, what's the entropy for, for anybody not familiar? Entropy is going to be like, um, you know, how much does the data vary? And when you compress something or you encrypt something, it basically brings everything up to an equal level. So the number of X's and the number of A's and the number of Y's in your file is exactly the same or pretty close. And that means you have high entropy. And so that generally means something is compressed or encrypted. It's also gonna look for attributes like, is the file signed? And does the file have anything weird? Are there any of these weird strings in it? What function is it calling, right? It's gonna pull all of these things out as attributes. 
And then it does a whole bunch of math to figure out this basically n-dimensional model, um, and, and it's a vector, right? Then they take this and they compare it to other known samples. So they're going to say, we have this thing that's like known malware, we have this thing that's not known malware. Do they, based on the features, look like this thing that we have? And if it looks like malware, then they categorize it as malware. And this is great because this means that you don't have to have seen the file before. And if you change the file, like say I add one byte to the end of the file or I, you know, change an A from a uppercase to a lowercase. If I'm only looking at the hash, totally new hash, I don't know that that file and the old file are the same. But through my machine learning, I look at it and I say, well, it still has basically all of the same features. So therefore it must be the same. Or even if it's not exactly the same, it's got to be similar enough that if a is malware b is malware okay so this is where they're getting to figuring out how the ai model works but for anybody who had used silence in the early days four years ago five years ago one of the things that uh pretty much everybody came back with feedback was there was a lot of false positives so it would flag on things and say they were malware even though they weren't and it's really hard to tune and fine tune your model when you're just taking a big thing and saying like, analyze these because these are bad and analyze these because these are good. Yeah. You end up with all these one-offs that you can't really do anything about. Yeah, and obviously false positives are you know, a big business yeah, problem. Yeah. Whether you're an IT, yes. MSP, you name it. Customers don't want false positives, especially on legit right. you know, things. Yep, and so they had to add this post-processing functionality into it. And what the post-processing would do is allow it to in very specific cases, if it matched a whitelist or if it matched a blacklist, it would allow them to override what the analysis engine said. And so the attackers, once, or the researchers, once they found this, they realized they could abuse this functionality if they could trick Silence into thinking that the file they had was a, one of these files from their whitelist. And so they started looking through and reverse engineering the code, and they found, um, they found in their references to a game uh, a game called Rocket League, which is fairly popular. Um, and for those who are not in the security community, there is actually a lot of security and defensive security that goes into these very popular video games. Um, and all of that comes from, like back in the day, video games um, were a lot of times really annoying to play online because people had bots and, and aim bots and, and cheats, and cheating was rampant. And it really ruined the online gameplay for people. So game companies spent a lot of money ramping up their defensive capabilities to make sure that people couldn't cheat um, and to detect things being changed in memory and all kinds of stuff. Downside to that is the stuff that they did to their binary looks very similar to what malware looks like, right? We're yep. talking about like <laughs> encrypted things in memory that are decrypted on the fly, like all the stuff John was just talking about, like all of these things look like malware. They have yeah, malware. I, I would use them as an attacker and clearly yeah. they're using them so you have a collision. Yeah, they have malware behaviors. So the problem was, you know, people who bought Silence were like, hey, I'm trying to play this really popular video game and Silence is calling it malware and deleting it and won't let me run it. So what Silence did is they went into the whitelist and they said, okay, if it's this video game, it's legit. And that's where the problem comes. And the, the problem is, like, how they decided it was the video game. They didn't want to deal with using a hash because if the video game updates, then that doesn't work. So basically what they did is they took a list of strings from the video game and said if it matches enough of these, yeah. it's this video Give game. Give it pop, po uh, positive reputation. And you see this from the Skylight research team that covered it. They, they, they distilled it down to one sentence, really. Namely, by appending a selected list of strings to the malicious file, we're capable of changing its score significantly to avoid detection. Yep. And so a lot of people were like, right away, you could assume like, oh my gosh, you know, is this a, you know, Silence, I can't use it. Actually, Silence is a quite great product. Like we have a boatload of partners that use it. Um, what a lot of us don't realize is the cat, and ga um, the cat and mouse game is constantly changing. For the last couple of years, a lot of some of the greatest talks at Black Hat are actually on adversarial machine learning or actually using some of this attacking machine learning with adversarial examples mm -hmm. just enough that you could take a picture of a panda with the right level of entropy and turn it into a duck in machine learning for picture recognition they've learned you could do very similar techniques to be able to do this to malware and put just the right amount of overlay that even though it still behaves and acts like a legitimate application it's enough to be able to fool some of these AIML models 
So that's part of the reason that like anybody, whether it's a, you know, CrowdStruck, Sentinel-1, Sophos, you name it, they all have models similar and everybody is responding back to this. Some companies are even adding defensive models to find this type of, you know, adversarial examples coming into their scenarios. So take that with a grain of salt. Silence has caught a lot of news, but anybody doing this type of stuff, it is part of the game. Um, we also had two questions, Chris. One was, mm -hmm. can we provide a copy of the, um, the script that we had? You know, or not the script, but the uh, the article. I actually found Silence had an amazing article that they did for White Paper uh, yeah. back when Glenn Chisholm was there and, you know, published like, hey, here's how we're doing it with software entropy to reveal symptoms of malicious code. Mm -hmm. So we'll share that one. Uh, but somebody else also asked the question. They said, Chris, like if uh, when you were talking about changing strings, they said, could you change something like Mimi Cats to like the word like mini skirt? Would it actually change yeah. or would would ML or AI be able to find that? Yeah, probably. Um, so actually in that blog post by Skylight, they talk about it um, where they took Mimikatz and they modified one byte, right? And they ran it. They ran the original through virus total. Everybody basically detected it as Mimikatz. They ran the new one with the one modified byte through and a whole bunch of people didn't detect it. But they did call out and say, hey, Silence is better than 50% of these other tools because they still did detect it as Mimi Cats and identify it as malicious. And that's really just the difference between signature-based detections where you have to have seen the file, know what the hash is, and any changes to that file are undetected by that old signature versus something like a next-gen AV where they're going to be doing behavioral type of stuff or in the case of Silence uh, and CrowdStrike and some others, where they're going to actually be using a machine learning model that's been trained to identify traits and attributes common to known malware. Gotcha. So, uh, people, I, we've answered a handful of those. Looks like we've got still a handful more questions. Um, makes sense to talk about .NET malware. Is it still a thing you all are seeing? Uh, I haven't seen that compiled .NET mal malware in a couple years. Uh, we do see, I'd, I'd lump PowerShell in there. We do see a lot of um, PowerShell code that's actually doing a lot of the things that we've seen in the past in the .NET malware. Um, so we do see that still, yes. All right, so what else do we got in here? In a recent interview, Secretary of State of Louisiana, some gentleman named Kyle is looking to pass a law that would require MSPs and MSSPs to register with the state said partly due to MSPs in Louisiana being compromised themselves when mm. their clients thought they were being protected. What are y'all's thoughts on this? Um, ooh, so we're, we're, in regards to defense evasion, um, I'm going to try to answer that through that angle <laughs> instead of taking this completely, uh, you know, in a different direction. At the end of the day, MSPs are obviously a ripe target or any type of supply chain. This could just be centralized IT for all the Remax, you know, uh, uh, the Remax, what is those called? Real estate? Is that the best way to yeah. describe them? If you think about all those, if there was centralized IT that took care of hundreds of different facilities or State Farm or any of that type of stuff, and they were compromised, they have the impact to, uh, or the ability to impact many. And when it comes to defense evasion, clearly we have seen actual hackers building some defense evasion like the last episode we talked about in the news there was ragnar locker ragnar locker yeah. and that actually killed off some of the uh processes that msps use do i think that is a solid idea i think that if we can't self-regulate ourselves in the msp market we're going to get more and more government that's going to step in and do it for us or tell us we have to do and we might not be happy with it so we're going to have to rise with that I do think if we think that's going to make hackers like be less evasive, that's crazy talk. Um, anybody got an opposing view or concurring view? I, I was just thinking like, aren't most MSPs already registered as a reseller anyway for the for the purpose of like the the tax benefits so that they don't pay tax for stuff that they're just going to resell? So I felt like people were already registered. Maybe maybe uh, some states don't need that, but. Yep. I'm oh, man, sure. that, that seems like that's a feisty uh, opinion in the comments. Uh, please, you know, even if you're on YouTube, comment <laughs> below and tell us uh, if this is terrible, assuming we enable comments. I, I don't on actually YouTube? know. I don't even know. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's one of those things. Like, there, there's pros and cons to it. Centralizing stuff allows you to, uh, you know, 
maximize your resources, your efficiencies, all of that stuff, but it also does in some cases give you a single point of failure. And, and so you just, you have to balance that. Uh, whether or not you need to be registered with the state. No. Uh, somebody just sent me a message saying it, it has to do with, I haven't read the article myself, but um, how many people the company employs and what security certifications and whether they discuss what they can and can't do with these customers. Hmm. Okay. So it's more of like a, a transparency thing. Yeah, with California's data protection laws that are coming into effect as well, we're seeing CMMC, that's that cyber maturity model uh, you know, requirements. This is happening. Uh, so I do think we all need to be prepared. Um, I'm not 100% sure, you know, CMMC uh, MMC for uh, level three for all MS, uh, MSPs is what someone mentioned in the comments. New York Shield Act has definitely had mm -hmm. some effect yeah. on some of this stuff. So I think we should all get ready for it uh, at a high level. Uh, with that said, we are coming up on the top of our hour. Yep. Maybe this is a good, good chance for us to plug. There will be a follow-up episode. There are so many more defense evasion uh, you know, techniques that we, we could cover. We see the craziest <laughs> stuff. Uh, because our job is discovering what slips by, you know, your preventive layers. So if you enjoyed, like, for instance, that live research that we did and, you know, the code signing capability, let us know. Um, if you want to see more of that type of stuff, live demos, if you think parts of our video could would be useful to, like, educate, you know, if you're educating your own management or you're educating your own, uh, you know, maybe clients, let us know. We'll make videos of those as well. You know, I write a script and say this is how you can describe it to your less technical audiences. Our whole goal of Tradecraft Tuesday is just to educate. So um, please continue sounding off. And uh, I think I'm done. I mean, we are at the top of the hour. I yep. hope whether you, you know, watch this breakfast, lunch, or dinner, uh, or, or just catching it up on, you know, a ride on a plane or something like this, we appreciate you joining us every month. Yeah, we got some upcoming shows. Uh, we're going to be at a lot of MSP Ignite shows if you go to those. Um, a number of Datto Road shows we're hitting. And Robin Robin's boot camp, boot camp is coming up, I think, next month. Um, so we'll be at all of those. If you see us, come by, talk to us. We got stickers there. Uh, Tradecraft Tuesday stickers, Huntress stickers, all kinds of great stuff. Um, on Thursday, we have a webinar. We're going to do some product updates talk about some of the features that we've released, um, how they can help you and improve your marketing and things like that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like Kyle said, come back next month for part two, where we'll talk about all the rest of the crazy interesting stuff. Yeah. On behalf of John, Chris, and myself, huge thanks for joining us for March 2020 of Tradecraft Tuesday. See ya. Yeah.